Hello, hello. Welcome to House Einstein Podcast 29. I'm Osman with House Einstein. And I'm Hamish, also with House Einstein. <laughs> uh, we are real estate agents in Boulder, Colorado. And House Einstein has been around since 2013 as a brokerage. We serve people here in the Boulder market, but our mission in this podcast is to help you make a smarter real estate decision, whether you are a client or not. And I should mention a little disclaimer that even though our mission is to help you make a smarter real estate decision, the way to think about this podcast is best as entertainment. And we are not your real estate advisors or your spiritual advisors uh, or your financial advisors. Uh, and uh, to keep our attorneys happy, this podcast is entertainment. If you happen to be a client, you know where to reach us, please do, and we can serve you much better that way. Perfect. <laughs> so you might have missed us last week. What was, uh, or should we do a little topic outline? Yeah, uh, well, um, no, we can jo- go right to, you might have missed us last week, but let me just mention something before we go there, and that's, if you like this podcast, mm-hmm. please subscribe. You can also subscribe to our newsletter. It's called Fresh Listings. You'll find it at houseeinstein.com. And if you're buying a home or selling a home in the Boulder market, in Denver, in uh, the mountain towns that are near the Denver market, including the resort towns, please reach out to us. We are more than happy to help you. Uh, You can find us online at houseeinstein.com. That's right. Well... You might have missed us last week, and uh, that's because we weren't in the state. Um, we, we took off, managed to sneak away a little bit uh, for an annual retreat, and uh, yeah, those annual retreats turn out to be more productive than I think uh, most people would imagine a retreat to be. I, I would, exp- looking from the outside in at what other people do at their retreats, it looks just like a big party. And uh, some of the big brokerages have a lot of glitz and glam going on. Um, But there isn't a lot of discussion about why they're doing a retreat. And um, my previous company would do holiday parties, but uh, never did retreats. And the reason we do them is because it brings our team together and gives us an opportunity to really connect, review what has happened during the previous 12 months, what are the lessons from that? What would we do again? What would we not do? And what should we be focused on in the coming year? And our brokerage is unlike any other brokerage that I've ever worked with or for or know about because we tend to behave much more like a group of colleagues that pool resources, almost like a law firm rather than Mm. a real estate brokerage with a bunch of independent contractors that are swimming together as sharks. Um, We actually work really well together as a team and strongly support each other's business, including covering each other when we're on vacations and, of course, helping each other produce amazing uh, online content that's educational and in line with our mission. Um, I mean, it's really really an amazing thing. And even though I've been in in the business 20 years, I still ask Sophie to review every one Mm -hmm. of my staging consultations because she has such a great eye for design and always catches things I missed. So uh, that's why we work together as a team. There's just so much benefit for it. And if one of us happens to be traveling, uh, our clients aren't left in the cold. Um, You don't miss out on a house because your agent's on vacation at House Einstein. No. And I dare I use the cliche word family, um, though it's it's real close. And uh, the way at the at this retreat, you know, we'd all sit down in the morning, kind of trundle out of out of bed and and hang out. And uh, it was just great. There it was such a frictionless kind of experience being with the team on this retreat. It always is. Well, I, I'm not sure I would use the term family because. Yeah. Uh, my family, I love them to pieces, but boy, we can have some serious dysfunction at times. And um, I, I, and you and your family, you can't uh, you can't I mean, choose. You choose. Can, like, you can cho- we have family we choose too. Uh, deep friends, I do, my wife and I do, and I, we've always had that. But um, I think of us really as a different entity entirely. And 
I'm reminded of a, a principle from Ray Dalio, and I can't remember the exact principle, but it was something along being really selective on the people that you choose to work with and making sure you have alignment in your mission and your values and what you care about because you spend so much time with these people. And if you don't feel good about working with them, you're wasting so much of your life um, trying to get something accomplished with people that are just not cut of the same cloth. Mm -hmm. And we've, I mean, honestly, I've learned that it's been a hard lesson, but I've learned that lesson. Um, not a lesson from this year, because, but, but the lesson has been that this team just keeps getting better and it's worth investing in an annual retreat. And we chose New Orleans because it's really unique. Why New yeah. Orleans? I mean, it's one of the oldest cities in America. It has a, a stunning architecture, a rich, um, although sometimes troubled history. It's a very diverse place. It has amazing music. Um, great food. Uh, great food. Uh, my, my scale does not lie. I <laughs> ate a lot of food last Did week. Did you? Oh, my. I, well, and things I probably shouldn't have eaten. Drank a little more than I probably shouldn't uh, should have drank. Um, Those but beignets. I, those yeah. beignets. I didn't know there were savory beignets. Yeah. Did you know? Okay. That crab one? Yeah. Did you know there were savory beignets? Those were truthfully my first beignets I've ever had. All of the ones we had in New Orleans. So I didn't actually know those oh. existed until seeing your story um, about a week or so before the retreat. <laughs> I'm getting culture That's... just just by being part of the team, you know? <laughs> Well, it's worth investing the time and resources to make these retreats happen. And if we didn't have such an amazing team, I, we wouldn't do it. So um, so that's what we were up to last week. We're, and I think you'll probably have a highlight reel out and then within the next week or so of uh, how that trip was, maybe a six-minute video or something. Um, but I just came back feeling really grateful. And um, one of the things we do spend a lot of time talking about are lessons from the past year. And yeah. any immediately popped to your mind, Hamish, of your lessons from the last year? No, not immediately to mind. I think <laughs> uh, part of discussing them, I may have put them to bed. Uh, they're not quite as uh, top of mind at the moment. Um, probably the, the larger one is being intentional with time. And uh, funnily enough, the book that I'm reading right now, Die With Zero, is about kind of maximizing life. And... Um, Real estate's an interesting one that you don't have set hours. So those times where you do find, when you do find yourself with free time, uh, it's difficult actually intentionally taking that time off and then uh, being present in the moment and separating yourself from just, you know, email threads and the market and just everything that you're constantly involved in otherwise. Um, so that's, that's my larger takeaway is just to be a little bit more, appreciative of the time that I do get and, and kind of maximize it. It's actually one of the hardest things about this job mm -hmm. and this business, the, um, the residential side in particular. I think the commercial side is more structured with normal office hours, but the residential side, we work nights, we work weekends, um, we work around our family events, and we have to be responsive, otherwise deals don't get done. So that is absolutely critically important. And it's one of these things where I don't know how people with – uh, little kids in particular manage it, um, but they must have amazing partners to handle that sort of dynamic flexibility to drop everything and go to a showing or negotiate something late into the night. Um, it mm -hmm. used to be worse. This they added a time of they added a time into the contract about four or five years ago, and now I routinely write six p.m. But some agents write eight p.m. into that like into that, some ten uh, and. And it's sort of crazy. I mean, we'll do it, but it's not my favorite. Like, why are we <laughs> yeah. working till 10 o'clock at night on a deadline? Um, but that is a challenge because personally, I feel like we're trained at an early age to tolerate like a structured schedule. Like you go to school. The expectation, right? 7.30 or 7 till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then you go home and like your brain is like, well, this is my work time and now I'm at home time. And a lot of people have a, in the real estate world have a really hard time with this because either they don't turn it off at all um, or they just can't adapt to the fact that we don't have a normal work day mm -hmm. um, where there's eight hours of work or 10 hours of work a day. It's totally different. Yeah. So it's essentially just uh being comfortable at calling it, right? Being like, okay, I have this these three hours or until an email pops up, I can kind of 
go and you know run some errands or or explore a hobby otherwise feeling kind of tied to the desk uh so to speak and um yeah we discussed this uh, particular thing, I think, almost constantly in our team meetings, and or we're just trying to optimize that, yeah. Right. And so many people struggle with it. Um, past assistants have struggled with it, mm-hmm. um, because they would str- strongly prefer to have 30 or 40 hours of structured work, and and then be off, but that's not this business, no. and it's it's hard to adapt, and uh, it's, it's actually hard to stop, it's harder to stop working and create playtime than it yeah. is to, or family time, like it's like this this like desire to constantly be working and not give yourself the time you need. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to be more intentional about taking care of oneself. But anyway, that's uh, that's the real estate business. <laughs> yeah, um, that that's pretty much top of mind for me. What about you? There are a couple of key takeaways. Um, so one thing I want to mention is it's, this is the end of the year. This is likely going to be our last podcast of the year. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to squeeze one more in, but this is the time of year that people think about a New Year's resolution. And I prefer to do a past year review and then um, create what worked uh, in the calendar for next year and commit to not doing the things that didn't work in the previous year. And I've been doing that for at least four or five years. Um, It came from Tim Ferriss originally, and I've adapted it personally and now a little bit professionally with this uh with, with with talking about these things together as a team on the retreat and for me um there were some tough decisions this year around saying no to certain business opportunities that were not working or clearly had signs of not working even though they had large payouts that were potentially going to happen if the if we were successful but there were signs that just strongly pointed to uh, us not being successful. And we talked about that in past podcasts, but immediately, and this is sort of bolder woo-woo, the universe responded, right? If you want to go there, opportunities presented themselves that were better and were, were better not just financially, but better from a growth perspective, um, allowed us to develop new skills and build great relationships with really solid people mm-hmm. that I think share some of our values. And I can't, I can't um, overstate this. There really is, it's critically important to work with people that um, you like working with and that you can add value to, not just as our team, but in the clients we choose mm-hmm. and that choose us. And if, if you know, if that resonates, frankly, it's, it's like the most important thing when you choose your agent is make sure this is someone you trust and this is someone whose values you believe in or that, that you share. Um, and then the questions of, of stuff like, well, wait a minute, our compensation is not lined up right. Uh, our, you can't solve contractually what doesn't exist in trust. Mm. Like there's no amount of contracting that's going to solve a trust issue. Um, so work with people you trust. But So that's one of the lessons. I mean, it was reinforced. It's not a new lesson. And um, it was strongly reinforced this year with several experiences. Uh, also, I think one of the key lessons is is in terms of our marketing and our content. Because we're so mission-driven, um, and that is a competitive advantage and a key distinction between us and the Compasses and Remaxes and all these other brokerages, the EXPs of the world, um, that's not what their branding is about because that's not what their mission's about. And that's radically what our mission and branding is about. And I feel like we may be able to do a better job of communicating that. Mm-hmm. Not sh- and the podcast is part of that. The blog has always been part of that. But in the other content that we're regularly putting out there, I think it's it's time to lean into that a little harder mm-hmm. um, and uh, and see what the outcomes are. I think that's really important. Yeah. And one of the things that we've been hitting on a lot over the past few months has been storytelling. And uh, Osman, you alluded to a, a little recap video of uh, the New Orleans trip coming up. This this will be a really fun uh, video. It's almost like a mini feature. And uh, we're trying out a few new editing techniques. We're uh, getting a little bit more into storyboarding. And um, I, I think it's going to be kind of like a fun way to recap the trip, but then also kind of set a new tone in what we're going to be doing um, from a content perspective for the next year. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I think the human soul and psyche yearns for story. And we're now at a place with our videography 
and our content production in general that is better than what we were paying for professionally prior to your arrival a few years ago. Mm-hmm. We're now well past that level. I look at the content from even three years ago and, and we're, uh, we're consistently producing extremely high quality, but the story is an opportunity. Creating better story, more meaningful story is an opportunity for us in Always, the coming yeah. year for sure. Um, on a personal note, it, it really is clear to me that service is a big component of what I'm here to do in my life. And real estate is one piece of that. But the other things that I've gotten more involved with, I've leaned a little harder into. I finally ended nine years on the board of Growing Gardens, which is a local nonprofit here in Boulder. A long stint. Uh, that's a pretty long stint. I think yeah. that was three terms I got elected for, and then you max out at nine. Oh. I was the treasurer for many years. Uh, and I was glad to not be the treasurer and end that role because <laughs> that was way more active than I expected. I'd but imagine. I also decided when I joined that board that I wasn't going to join it just because I, then I could say I'm on the board. It was because I really wanted to be of service to an organization whose values I believe in and whose mission and service I believe in and who are filled with an organization that's filled with amazing people. Well, that, that ended and um, there was a crossover year. I joined the board of the dairy. Um, and I really have just started getting to know it, but this year was the year of leaning more into that and getting a little bit more involved. I'm on the finance committee, but the, uh, I'd like to get more involved in the events and certainly want to feature more of the upcoming stuff for the dairy because I want to support their mission in the arts. And the arts are something I used to be much more involved in in college um, and in high school, especially music theater, uh, but all sorts of arts. And then... Um, um, uh, A new opportunity presented itself in the spring that came out of nowhere and was a challenge. It was, was, I hesitated because, look, there's only so much time to go around in life. And uh, there's only so much butter to spread on the bread or whatever. There's only so much Osmond to go around. And this opportunity was so compelling, I couldn't say no. And uh, there's an organization that was founded called Hearth and Stone. And the founders reached out to me to see if I was interested in being on their board. Uh, We changed the structure so it's not called a board anymore. It's called an advisory team because it's not really, um, it's not a nonprofit. And uh, a board membership or or board service also entails liability. And without some of those structures in place, we changed the naming and structure so that uh, I don't need directors and officers (laughs) insurance. Uh, yeah. but this organization, I'm now a, 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 an advisor. I've been an advisor this year to the Hearth and, Hearth and Stone Luxury Home Tour. And this is an entity that is primarily in Boulder County. And they create broker-only house tours of luxury homes. And it is not tied to any particular brokerage. Um, they reach out to high-end agents and uh, get these houses on the tour. There's a membership to become part of Hearth and Stone. And then um, the opportunity is for agents to meet with each other and collaborate, um, to learn to get to know each other, and also to keep on top of what's happening in luxury marketing as well as happening within our local market. And the sellers have an opportunity to get their houses on the tour, and the agents have an opportunity to learn and network in an authentic and meaningful way. And also we can create some great content around these. And as a team, they're really fun team outings uh, for House Einstein itself. So. Um, we're not officially a sponsor, but clearly with all four of us involved, I would like to say that we're very active at Hearth and Stone. Yeah. And um, that was a really uh, big step into service. And uh, there's no financial benefit. I'm not an owner of Hearth and Stone. Um, I just see it as a great way that uh, it brings people together in community to serve in our industry and benefit from a network, uh, both the agents, but also the, the sellers as well. It's activity, you know, and uh, and just being active in the local market, not to, uh, it, it just, it bolsters exactly what you do. It gives you more experience and it also is a fantastic ne- networking uh, opportunity as well. Yeah. So. I mean, the, the older I get, the more um, making lots of money becomes, the less that becomes a priority. Um, the older I get. And one of the things about a past year review, one of the things you're supposed to do, Hamish, is you're supposed to create a plus and minus column. Mm. And you're supposed to look at your calendar and go through it week by week of last year and write down the things that moved the needle, um, plus or minus, that really 
create a distinct memory for you of positive or negative from whatever your baseline is. And mm -hmm. for me, when I did that, there were also a number of things that came up around community. Um, and this year we launched officially uh, the Boulder Brownie Club. And this is, so I, I don't talk about ethnicity or, or, or racial issues very often, but my ethnic background is from a part of India called Punjab. And there are quite a few people of Indian origin or Pakistani origin or Bangladeshi or Sri Lankan or Nepali or Tibetan origin that live here in Boulder. And collectively, this region of the world, to those that are from this region of the world, is called the Desh. And people hmm. from this region of the world affectionately call each other desis. And so I decided what Boulder could really use is something that's not tied to a religious institution, a temple or a gurdwara or a masjid, but is tied to just this ethnic connection of Indian food and a culture that um, sometimes is, is uh, very fixated on Bollywood and cricket. Um, but there's many of the second and third generation that now live in the United States. And I've had a, quite a few clients that um, have said to me one of the downsides of living here in Boulder County is the lack of people from the Desh, uh, the lack of, of people that share our ethnic background. Um, and this is cross religions. And again, I'm not particularly religious, by the way. Um, so these are but these are people from across different faith categories in of Indian origin. And I finally decided I've had enough. Uh, and this year I, I, I got together with my friend Gurpreet. And I think this started in January. I, I met with her. I can't remember why. And we, we were having cocktails. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to create a community club of some kind that gets together regularly and we eat good food, we do activities. It's modeled on an organization um, that I used to be part of in Boston called the Network of South Asian Professionals that no longer exists, but you might be able to find them on Google, um, that used to do all sorts of outdoor activities entirely. Um, and they were all young, professional South Asian people. And so that's what we sort of modeled the idea on. And we started meeting. Um, we, we call each other the Boulder Brownie Club. <laughs> and... Uh, we've been meeting about once a month. So that's been really a rich um, community activity this year for me. That definitely moved the needle. And you could find that, by the way, if you are interested. You don't have to be Desi. Um, you can just be interested or uh, you know, Desi adjacent. It, it's fine. Um, there's lots of people that are not Desi that come. There's um, not a bouncer a at the door. <laughs> There's no bouncer at the door. If you like Indian food and Indian culture and you want to go for a hike and, and have some drinks, well, this is – and you live here in Boulder. Or actually, one guy comes from um, uh, Parker. He, he comes hmm. from quite a ways. No, he wow. comes from Aurora every time he joins. That's cool. Um, and he said he's been living here for years and he's been looking for this type of thing. Um, so people are finding us on Facebook and there's a WhatsApp group and – uh, so, but the easiest way to find us is there's no website yet. So just look for us on Facebook or message me privately and I'll connect you to the group um, if you're interested. And we meet about once a month. So that's a fantastic, rich social community thing that came out of my past year review. Um, the cruisers, the Boulder cruisers are um, a bicycling group. I leaned a little harder into that. Um, I leaned a little harder into things like Burning Man and regional events and being a ranger. I'm kind of ripping through this kind of quick, but um, <laughs> there's been a lot of leaning into family um, and relationships, both mine and, uh, and my wife. So it's not just been about building depth in our team. But it's been about building depth in all these other areas of life, too. And it's been a really rich year. That's 2023 for, for me personally. Um, Hamish, I don't know if you've spent much time thinking about your past year review. Anything pop up for you that made this year rich? It's bad to say no, um, because I, there's plenty of things that have happened that have uh, added richness to my life this year. Um, though nothing at the moment that I, I think I'm ready to quite share. I'll say that the big uh, keystone moments is I purchased a house, which has been incredibly rewarding and... Uh, Kind of a, a roller coaster of emotions, especially being a little younger in the demographic of doing it, and kind of, yeah, just the the back and forth on that emotionally. But at this point, it's kind of it, it's a pretty amazing experience being a, a, a stead, a homestead, a, a 
purveyor of my own property, a, a homeowner, just very caring and uh, really interested in maintenance. And um, I've just thoroughly enjoyed that part of things. It's also been fantastic uh, helping friends and seeing my my personal community around me grow and thrive and, and lending a hand to that. Have you noticed any sort of difference? Does it, does it feel different to pay a mortgage versus pay rent? Does that feel different for you? I don't know. I, I've looked at the numbers and there's no way this is true, but it feels cheaper. Um, for some reason, like, you know, you are technically kind of paying yourself. And I looked at my uh, loan payoff things. And I think for the, I've had this house since July. And I think I've only paid like $500 towards the, the uh, principal. <laughs> but um, no, it feels, uh, it, it's a lot lighter. We were talking when I had my first few uh, mortgage payments that it would be this uh, kind of really stressful event. And then eventually it would peter off and just become part of daily life. And it really has. And then it's, you know, oh, well, that needs fixing. Okay, well, we have until the end of time, technically, you know, I'm never going to get rid of this house. So it's a really nice feeling knowing that you're kind of cemented, and especially being in the front range. I'm just so incredibly fortunate for that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we just had this meeting with clients earlier today who asked, you know, why should we be concerned about flips? And, and, I, and I explained to them that um, flips often are very poor quality, right? They're, mm. <clears throat> excuse me, they are poorly executed. Profit and centered. Got one profit centered. And when you own a home and you're making improvements, you make them sometimes for yourself, mm -hmm. but you often, you know, you're usually for yourself, and and you're often investing maybe a little more than you would if you were just trying to flip it for a profit. And you're choosing your contractors more carefully. Longevity matters because you yourself plan to enjoy this product or this aspect of the home. So it's the quality is much higher. So I personally will, would rather have a slightly dated house mm -hmm. that was updated by the primary homeowner than have a brand new flip that yeah. was updated by for um, market, you know, runaway. See you later, LLC. <laughs> Good luck. We'll call you. We'll call you. Don't call me. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Because those guys, those people, are just likely have not done the quality work that you yourself would do. Mm -hmm. There's um, on the back of my head as I'm making, you know, very slight improvements, little bits of aesthetic and quality of life things to the house. Um, it, it's in the back of my mind, you know, like, are you doing this type of work? Is it ever going to pay off if the house sells? And I've kind of silenced that part because I genuinely just enjoy doing things for myself and doing it in the house. Anything that I do that's an improvement, to me feels like at the very minimum, it's just going to bolster the value. You know, there's the worry that if I, you know, were to pop the top and do all these crazy renovations, the neighborhood doesn't support what I would have to ask from it. You know, um, I'm, I'm not at that level yet, but I'm, I'm not sweating necessarily what the sale is going to look like right now. I'm just happy having a house. Right. Yeah. But if you needed to do something like, replace your flooring mm -hmm. likely you would choose flooring that lasts a lifetime yeah. versus flooring that you're going to need to replace again in five or ten years big time um because it's more durable and maybe it's more sustainable and and you can hire a craftsman to do the work rather than a hack that will get it done for cheap right right you can sell it really fast like the mentality is so different no exactly um, it doesn't doesn't have to be pop the top um you know just just a that, that's a huge Hamish buying your first home is one of the biggest events in life at, at least for, for me it was when I bought my first house it, here, I mean, here, it's not yeah. quite as big of an event as say getting married but it's it's in the top 10 pretty, pretty dang up there yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and, uh, no that's it's been um, just kind of that roller coaster you know and kind of how does it does owning a home define you and you know like do I change who I am or does it give me a chip off my shoulder and making sure it doesn't and uh, you know just <laughs> uh, navigating all that is uh, these like subtleties that I wasn't really expecting as a, a first time home buyer yep mm -hmm. I mean next thing you know you're going to start worrying about how much you're paying in taxes and what they're using the money for Hamish yep. well, hey, I, I got I got really into it uh, on the local elections you know I was like researching all the people and <laughs> Getting into that. I might go to a, a town hall hearing here soon, you know. <laughs> rah, Good. Rah. I'm really glad, yeah. glad to hear that. Uh, you also served on a, a jury this year. That was oh. a really big deal. 
Yeah, that was maybe a nightmare. You almost blocked it out. Kind of. Yeah, it's like a waking dream. Um, You know, you get pretty uh, into your routine and everything. And for two weeks straight, suddenly that's completely changed. It's a whole new routine. It's a new office. It's um, everything just changes. Um, And it was um, I liked the jury before we started deliberation. And then after we started deliberation, I I don't really like the jury that I served with um, that, that much. Seeing the process, it was for the um, Colorado Supreme Court, and seeing the process, uh, seeing kind of how that all works was really interesting for me. I love seeing the lawyers get up there and um, do their depositions and um, question the witnesses and everything, and uh, that was really neat. It was also fun. I got to... Lawyers typically you think of as kind of like unbreakable professionals. Um, they A lot of them lost their cool which was kind of fun to see. And, you know, I'm, we're just laymen in the jury seats. Um, so it was neat just kind of seeing all that. Yeah. Um, I guess the last thing, uh, you just kind of put a bow on this um, past year review for me. Do you want to have, do you have anything last to add to it? Anything else popping up before I cut back to me? No, no you're good. <laughs> yeah. Cut it, cut away. Okay, I I guess I missed some of the travel I did this year. Mm. I made a really big trip. I took a really big trip to India for three weeks, um, and that was to reconnect uh, with my family's ancestry and roots in um, Punjab. And I had to make some sacrifices, including I think I, I know I lost the listing because uh, I told them I was leaving. Um, I probably should have led with how amazing our team was and had the team be part of the, that meeting, uh, but. Uh, they were ready to sign a listing agreement, and they, uh, as soon as I, I told them I'm going to be in India for, you know, when you're trying to go live, mm-hmm. um, and that was like deal killer for them, which was sad because I think they're actually listeners of the podcast, and uh, they did choose a good agent. Um, the home did go under contract. I think it's now closed. Um, it would have been a fantastic listing. I was super excited about all of our videography for it. Um, the take home lesson of that is uh, to bring the team when the team is part of the presentation. Mm-hmm. Um, that would have probably changed the outcome of that. But I'm also really gr- glad that I went to India for the three weeks I was there. And um, there's a lot to unpack. I still am processing that trip. Mm. Um, we also we, we lost Jackson this year, um, who's our black lab. And I came home pretty early because of that. Um, he died right before I left. And this, this kind of segues back to friends and family for us a dog is family and and losing him was a really big deal um was painful and also bittersweet you know you you get them when they're puppies or younger and you get to enjoy all their vibrant years and then they get old and they get kind of cranky and they get personality that's not unlike humans get when they get old you know they they've got their they're a little slower you have to be a little more patient with their quirks Mm -hmm. um and maybe they need medicine and medical care, and you have to, you can't go on vacation because they need caretaking. Um, that sort of stuff is part of owning a dog and part of being, I don't know, part of having family and people in your circles. Uh, so I was gl- grateful for the time I got to spend in India, um, but it also required some trade offs and also shorter than I wanted it to be, but I'm really grateful I got to go. And even though I lost the listing over it, um, there's some lessons there too. So I think that is sort of it in a nutshell. And the end of the past year review is you're supposed to lay out your calendar for 2024 and put in some key things that are in line with what moved the needle in a positive way and take some of the things off your calendar that moved the needle in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Um, And and there's, of course, a lot more to it than just the stuff we shared. But I think as a... a, uh, uh, individually that and in the professional way that's those are the key high points for me yeah yeah the uh, constant improvement on our videography and marketing is one of the more, most exciting things yearly you know monthly even um, we I obsess has a negative connotation to it but we're, we're real close to doing that almost constantly and um, like Osman said, it's market. You can look in our older content and then see now, and it's just a constant evolution. It's probably it's a, one of my biggest a, pluses. 
it's a mastery area mm -hmm. and your role in this in this company gives you a huge opportunity to keep scratching that itch and keep working on mastery and and I, we could see a huge improvement in the quality of your content yeah. um, and what you're producing both from behind the camera and in the post um, it's all improved markedly in the last 12 months so yeah. great job with that thank you well thanks for um, uh, being along with the journey and all of your input too Oh, it's a win-win. It's an opportunity for the company, and it's an opportunity for you um, personally. So it's been fantastic. That definitely um, has been a big plus for everyone this year. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about our sale of the week. Or should we wait? You think that's the most exciting part of this podcast, Hamish, is our sale of the week? I think we should uh, swap that around with our uh, other point. Sale oh, of the week market is conditions. interesting. Yeah, but we should uh, All right. kind of just... Let's talk about the market yeah. first, and then we'll hit the sale of the week. We'll wrap it with sale of the week. So um, what has happened? Fourth quarter is almost over, and I've put out quite a bit of market intel already on the fourth quarter. I'm not going to rehash it, but big picture, as expected, there were a number of capitulations. Hmm. Uh, there were sellers who finally had enough and took a low offer. Um, and buyers with cash were primarily able to uh, capitalize on that opportunity, and that's at the higher end of the market. So I remember when I did the data year over year, I think this was like mid-November at $3 million plus in Boulder. There's more sales in 2023, $3 million plus than last year. Uh, yeah. So the high end of the market is, is, has not slowed at all. Um, although prices on a dollar per square basis have dropped, and buyers have more selection. Um, some sellers still got bidding wars at all price points, um, but lots of people got frustrated and took their homes off the market. Um, and those homes are probably going to come back in the spring. And so here, really, it's now time to, to stop talking about the fourth quarter. It's basically over. And it's time to talk about what to expect next year. And rates are widely expected to come down. Uh, the Fed is talking about dropping the discount rate, I think three times, three federal rate cuts. Um, and those have a direct impact on the entire yield curve. And that results in, you know, the 10 year mortgage, the 10 year treasury. Sorry, my, I've got a head cold. I don't know if you can hear this, but my brain's a little fuzzy. So please pardon the head cold and the fuzziness. But the 10 year treasury is closely linked to the 30 year fixed rate. And likely it's going to come down. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if rates are three quarter of a percent lower by the end of summer or early fall next year. That's my crystal ball uh, forecast is rates are going to keep coming down. And Boulder and Denver in the front range did see a price correction from the peak, um, but there really wasn't that much bloodshed. Most people are up year over year, not down. It's quite unless slight. You happen to, yeah, if you bought it at the very peak frenzy March, April of 2022, you were unhappy. But that's only if you needed to sell your house. Uh, if you didn't need to sell your house, okay. I mean, it, it sucks that you paid more than maybe you should have, but hopefully you bought the right house. And that's always the key goal when you're shopping for a home is timing the market should be so much lower of a priority mm -hmm. than getting the right house. It is so much harder to find the right house than time the perfect – well, timing is hard too, but it's really – it's so challenging to find the right home. Um, and working with people that can help you do that is so important. And in my opinion, a lot of people, I don't know, they can't, they, they, they bought the wrong house. Uh, but as rates drop, uh, I think we're gonna, I think inventory is gonna actually start to drop. Yeah, it has. Uh, which is, yeah, well, it, it's gonna start dropping harder. So yeah. year over year, inventory is probably gonna, it's this this little window of higher inventory. I think maybe has another month or two, maybe three max before it's gone, because. People that recognize that when rates drop that much, they can potentially just refi into the future. So a lot of buyers that sat on the sidelines this year are going to re-enter the market in the spring. Um, it would not surprise me to see a return of bidding wars and nonsense. Agreed. Which, I mean, we're really good at managing those uh, and, and helping our clients be successful. But it's not a, it's not a low-pressure environment. It's a high-pressure, high-stakes environment with big dollars on the line. Um, and it would not surprise me at all if we're not in exactly that zone by March or April. Um, a lot of the so, um, a lot of the systems we have now are born of that intense competitive environment, um, and it's almost like I kind of have an excitement to stretch those systems legs again. 
Um, it is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like being a fire person. Like you put the flashing red light on top of your your car, and you're rushing to be, you know, get your first showing in early on the weekends and get your clients uh, the intel they need on the comps so that they're ready to write the offer mm-hmm. that day intelligently. Like not on the hood of the car when they just saw this house with no market knowledge, but with deep market knowledge, having seen lots of other homes, and now they see that the value is here on this home. And when we tell them yeah they're expecting multiple offers and we're talking about all the strategies to to play you know potential strategies to execute in this environment you know we're ready it's exciting there's an Mm -hmm. excitement to that that pace um it's also stressful (laughs) and uh it's a good thing i don't have any hair (laughs) (laughs) says you man no and it's great our, our I mean, we want our clients not to feel that stress, so we manage it quite a bit for them. It's our stress. Um, it could also be, a, it could be fun. It's not, we're not the ones that are going to lose the house if you go too low. Mm-hmm. Um, or we're not the ones that are going to be upset that you pay too much. Uh, and that's, I always tell my clients that don't write an offer for any more than you, you're going to regret. Like even a dollar more than you're going to, like don't, if you're going to regret the extra dollar, don't do it. Stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the, you will never know what the other offers were. And it's that sleep um, at night thing, right? You know, like it, make sure you can sleep at night at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Because you terminating the contract because you feel like you're overpaying is not actually an exit in the contract. And if that's the reason you're actually terminating, it's actually bad faith, mm-hmm. um, which is why a lot of people just check the box that says inspection and don't say anything else because it's not the house. It's the fact they just regret the contract price. Um, so the, like one in five were bouncing back because of that during the peak of the frenzy. And that was rule of oh, really? five. I don't have, yeah, I don't have the wow. statistics that prove that. Um, so should you wait? If you're sitting on the sidelines, Hamish, what do you think? Should you wait? If you see the right house, it looks like a good one for lower rates. I'm always like the, the caveat guy. Um, well, it depends, Osman. If you can handle it, I, I think it's generally, you, you have this privilege of, first of all, like a little bit of a slower market. So competition, depending on the price point that you're looking, is going to be a lot less than it will be when rates come down. Um, You have a little bit more selection. You have sellers that are maybe getting a little bit more desperate. Um, So potentially some room for negotiation, though that comes at a higher carrying cost. And you don't necessarily know rates will come down. And depending on what you finance as well, you best be sure you can uh, handle those payments for quite a while if you're thinking you'll refinance later um yeah it's interesting i on the flip side of that you might have a whole lot more buying power give it a month or two and that could be a whole great but, but then right <laughs> you're in what a, happens to prices <laughs> yeah then they shoot up and then you're still in a bidding war and um yeah i think those that are solvent right now that are picking off the more desirable listings are always going to get kind of the pick of the litter you call it um, the longer you wait, the worse selection is going to get, and the more you may have to put up with. Um, well, when you're I don't searching. know if I agree with that completely. Wow. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's hey, one, that's one take. Well, <laughs> so here's the. Well, I mean, that's okay that we don't necessarily yeah. agree, but here's here. In fact, it's good when we have different opinions. Um, I get to learn, and that's one thing that you do get the benefit of as a client is that we'll, you may get two different opinions from us, and you you decide. It's like getting a second opinion from a doctor. Or you're going to get two opinions both of which are from market participants, both of whom are trying, in theory, to advise you to the best of their knowledge, um, prices could be higher, selection could be lower or higher. And the, and the key word, and maybe we'll make this the title of this podcast, the key words are opportunity cost. Yeah. And, and so if you see a home that you think is worth buying, the first question in my head is always, well, how do I know there's not going to be a better home at a lower price on a better street next week. By you getting don't. married to this house, I'm not shopping anymore. If I am, that's an exercise of bad faith. Um, or even three months down the line, I bought this house and now the, the neighbor's house that I really wanted goes for sale and it's for less. Boy, that's gonna be painful. You can't go buy that house too. Mm-hmm. So when you buy one house, you are giving up the opportunity for these other homes. And one thing that we do with our clients, and I think I've mentioned this before in the podcast, is that you we, we sit down with them on a live call. We run the MLS, show them what the last 12 months looked like. What was Let's available. Look, 
Yeah, let's look at your criteria, beds, baths, the neighborhoods that we finally have triangulated it down to, the price range you really care about, all of those details, the square footage, the age of the home, the style of the home, the garage spaces, the lot size. Let's get granular about what you think is the dream home and let's see how many sold last year. And if there's like 30 houses that sold in the last 12 months, well, that tells you there's two or three houses a month that are likely going to sell this year, although most of that will be in the summer, not evenly spread out over the course of a year. And that should give you reasonable confidence that there'll be a nice house, maybe a better house, if you miss this one. But if there were two houses like this that sold last year, and you've, you're, you've got one of them in your, you know, in your gun sight, the odds of you seeing another one are profoundly low. And you could look back three years if you want. Okay, so maybe there's only two that sold last year. I just remember we did this analysis for our clients looking at prospect. And we looked at, well, yeah, we was did. this home value priced? Because they, were, they weren't ready to write an offer, but I just wanted to walk them through that process. And there were no homes that sold in the last 12 months that would have matched. But you had, you had to go back two or three years to see homes that were similar to what they would have been interested in. And then you could do a price adjustment and, and, and uh, move these prices up three years in, in time to the future value of those past sales to get a sense of what those homes might sell for today. And that maybe these homes like this will show up or maybe nothing will show up again. Um, the reason nothing likely showed up is higher rates and sellers are quite happy where they are with their super low rates from two or three years ago. So why would they list? Yeah, unless they had to. Unless they had to. Divorce, death, um, job changes, those have been the primary drivers of new listings coming to market. It's, I mean, it's, people recognize how important housing is in, in terms of their overall portfolio, as well as their lifestyle. Most people, the American dream, as I like to say, is not to rent a house from your landlord and pay their mortgage off. Mm -hmm. It's to get it's your to own mortgage. Your own. No. <laughs> yeah, it's to pay off your mortgage. Yeah. It's to have your your raise your family in, in a neighborhood that matters and get to know your neighbors and build community and relationships. Um, and you can't it's harder to do that as a renter. You're always beholden to the landlord that could pull the rug out from under you. You have no legal right past the, the duration of your lease in most cases mm -hmm. to stay in that house. So Interestingly enough, um, we we hit opportunity cost really early on in the podcast series. I think it was maybe four or five. Um, that came out right after we finished up a deal in Newlands. And I remember being on the phone with that client and he brings up the fact that uh, because I still have the same stance that I did when we recorded that podcast. You know, I was kind of when you I don't need to recap it. Um, but he was like, yeah, it's opportunity cost. You know, this house in Newlands doesn't come up often. That's why we jumped on it. You know, like we knew there wasn't going to be another one coming around and that that was right. the big deciding factor for us. Yep. Really like those clients yeah. and really want to spend more time with them. Um, still need to do some sort of fancy closing dinner with them. No, we, we did something. You guys did. Leah and I did something. Yeah. Yeah. We need to do something with you. They demanded to see you. Hey, did they? so, uh, that, that is going to happen in the first quarter if you guys are listening. We won't mention their names, but they know we're talking about them. And that was a lot of fun, mm -hmm. those clients, especially some of their requests. Like, you know, what does the neighbor, the other, the competitive listing look like at night mm -hmm. from the street? Because they were thinking about writing an offer on one or the other. And so I'm out there with a big camera lens in the dark <laughs> shooting house photos. Hopefully in a trench coat. Looking like a stalker <laughs> yeah. uh, on the streets in Newlands. Or, or like a private eye yeah. like, people were walking by me giving me the hairiest eyeball I've ever gotten in my life as I'm shoot and the windows I asked the listing agent to open all the window all the curtains all the window coverings turn on all the lights let's see what privacy looks like on, for this house at night and boy it just looked it looks sketch it was that Liz sketch. or a different listing agent it was um, it was not Liz oh, okay. this is who they bought the house from mm -hmm. it was or we bought the house with it was uh Oh my brain is this is either way it was nice of them so many to deals uh, with her yeah uh, Jen uh, uh, J Ryan um, I don't think I Jill, know Ryan Jill Ryan yeah I think that's right Jill Ryan yeah is that, is that Jill is it Jill oh my god my brain is so fried we'll get there her last name's Ryan <laughs> okay this is so bad sorry I'm so sorry you're a friend of mine and I can't remember <laughs> your name right now um, yeah so uh, this is the head cold talking. Um, but it does come down to your specific situation, right? Um, where you, where the opportunity cost 
equates in your in your search for a home right for me i'm looking for a kind of more standardized home a little bit less special location was a little less important than me i wanted the corridor west of uh wadsworth but i wasn't too fussy on where i ended up north or south relative to boulder so long as it was within a certain range um and, and even during the high rate environment that was this year i think this house received two other offers um, yeah, and so even like entry level pricing still has this insane demand. Yeah, for every decent house, there's usually two or three um, potential buyers lurking. Mm -hmm. So, yep, if it's a good house, you could expect that to knock happen again, and and have more than two or three. Um, which, uh, if we do see that sort of frenzy, one thing to keep in mind is if you hear these people bragging about how their house got 15 or 20 offers or agents talking about how they got 15 or 20 offers on their listing, it's actually a sign of incompetence. You can't negotiate with 20 people at once. You can only negotiate with two or maybe three counterparties. Um, I, I would argue four is probably absolute max to really get four contracts to have time to review them and then... Um, pit them against each other, which means using the be the strongest aspects of one contract to strengthen the other contracts. That takes time. It's done verbally, and it's under a timeline of pressure for response deadlines. There's no way to do that with 15 or 20 contracts at once. That's a that's a that's somebody who should have gotten those other people to just not. They were if you're not going to compete. If your contract was not going to be in the running, why bother submitting? Yeah, and let them know not to bother submitting. That was um, before this house. I'd submitted on an, on another, and that listing agent got back to us. He had eighteen, I think, other contracts. And that that's the whole. I remember that's when we started talking about the, the competence of an agent to field offers and and not get everybody's hopes up. Or yeah, that was just uh, pretty ludicrous. Yep. Um, <clears throat> okay. I think that it's time to move to um, yes, our please. last topic du jour. Um, oh, hold on. One last thing. Mm. One of your questions as we made this intro was, uh, should you expect sellers to capitulate in the first quarter uh, for uh, you know listings that are refreshed that came back from the fourth quarter? probably not as eager to capitulate so if they if it's a listing that was withdrawn in december and they come back in mid-january or february um it's unlikely they're going to accept a low ball the first weekend it's on the market unless there's zero other showings happening uh, you're the only person who came and saw it maybe they'll take a low offer um but it's it's case by case you may have to do some some snooping on the ground to get a sense for how many showings they've had. I mean, that's why that's why buyers agents will always ask, well, do you get a lot of showings? Have you had other offers? And you know, the, you, how you answer that question can have huge swings in value. Um, usually the best answer as a listing agent is, I'm sorry, I can't really tell you uh, how many showings we've had or how many other offers. Or we'll say, you know, what they usually say is actually this. They say, oh yeah, we've had lots of showings. There's two or three or four buyers swirling, but no offers yet, right, which is, the classic smoke and mirrors they're not going to tell you anything yeah that's the that's the answer they're not going to tell you anything um so okay let's move to the last item hamish negotiation starts um, at the first phone call that's that should be a bumper sticker <laughs> yeah i mean well negotiation actually starts um it isn't actually the first phone call anymore it's it's now negotiation starts with what you say in the house mm. because yeah, of all the cameras <laughs> It starts from the street. It starts from the car you drive when you pull up. If you're rolling up in a Bentley, um, they're going to think you're loaded. Mm -hmm. And they're going to think they can take you for a ride. And you, you walk into the door and you say, oh, my God, I love this house. Well, the doorbell camera caught that entire conversation. Yeah. Um, and in theory, they don't have interior cameras, but you're better off to just assume they do. That We tell all of our buyers, that please don't make our job harder by falling in love with the house verbally, physically. <laughs> Telling, telling each other, oh my God, we have to have this one in the doorway. Like we need to be a stone you wall. <laughs> you, well, you need to like you know, you'd ask some questions. I'll point out what's wrong with it. 
Uh, maybe we need a code word where you, you're like, this is the uh, safe word, right? Like, here's the here's the suddenly you've mentioned bananas in the listing. I know you want this one, and I'm going to start pointing out everything wrong in the in the doorstep. Not everything right with the house. This house is. But then bananas. they might wonder why the heck you're why you <laughs> why you're submitting if you hate the house so much. So just be cognizant that you're under surveillance at every showing. It's no longer the phone call. Mm-hmm. Um, that begins negotiation. So let's talk about the sale of the week, Hamish. That's what we're trying to get to. Yeah. That's what we made people wait. <laughs> we got only a few minutes left. Uh, well, we actually, I mean, we could keep going. We're not under an hour guideline, but we try to keep these to an hour. I think we're probably going to end up a little past this time. So um, 1844 Pine Street is our sale of the week. Yes, sir. It's MLS number 997136. I'm sorry, Hamish, what did you say? I said, yes, sir. You're good. Okay. Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this home was built in 1904. It's a, a square, a four square, sometimes called a Denver square. Um, and it, it, uh, did I already say it was built in 1904. It's a historic home. It's in the historic surveys. It was noted as well built and artistic in the historic uh, inventory record. I think it was a 1987 survey. So this is a home that is known to the historic people, um, which means that don't expect there to be much allowance for what you can do in modification of the exterior, but um, it may or may not be in the district. I've got to go look and see if it's in a historic district, but it's still built in 1904. So um, anything significant is going to require some sort of historic review because it's Boulder and that's how we roll. But this home, um, had been owned by the sellers since 2005. So almost 20 years they've been in this house. I won't tell you what they paid for it. Um, and, uh, and and they, f- they finally decided to list it. And when they first listed it uh, in September. So I tell my clients, this is not a good time of year to list. Uh, end of September, wait till January, right? I, and I, I suspect if they waited till January, they would have gotten their list price at 2.85. Um, because it's it was a pretty impressive house. So let me walk through the listing history, Hamish, and then you can talk about your experiences in the house because you actually took our clients to see it. Did you um, um, did you hit the fundamentals though? Levels, bathrooms, beds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me keep hitting that. Yeah. So forty three hundred square feet, all of which was finished. Two car off street parking, so no garage. Um, structured as a five bedroom, six bath. And uh, it was listed in end of September at 2.85, went under contract about 10 days afterward um, and listed as pending. So usually when you, when you change the status to pending, you don't want any other showings um, because showings suck. <laughs> uh, you've got strangers in your home and you don't want them coming in. You don't need a backup offer. Well, surprise, less than a week later, it was back to active. So buyer number one bailed. Um, there's no disclosure publicly about why buyer number one bailed. Um, by the way, that square footage includes the carriage house. Oh, really? Uh, um, yep. So it's not just the carriage house is part of that square footage. Um, and uh, it's located. I mean, location is always critical. It's in the 1800 block. Uh, so around the corner from busy 19th Street, but uh, still an excellent spot. Easy to walk to downtown Boulder shops and restaurants. Um, walk over to Pearl. It's only a couple of blocks away. Uh, coffee shops, bars, all of that is right there. And you've got one of the most classic designed homes. And in the photos, it looked pretty updated. And I could walk through the photos. But Hamish, you showed the client because I was out of town this was when this listing popped India up. India trip, And they right? wanted to see it. I think so. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I remember messaging you um, while I was out front of the house, you know, 10, 20 minutes early. And you were like, it's 2 a.m. I can't sleep. <laughs> Because <laughs> you had a whole bunch of that in India. Um, no, this house showed really, really well. And uh, before I'd even shown up, I think the listing agent reached out to me and was saying, you know, any questions, please reach out. Really proactive in that sense. Um, creaky. The, the I'm just going to like, the, the biggest standout, I think, was just really creaky. It was just to be expected for an older home, especially. Like the of, floors were creaky? Yeah, mega. Heading up the stairs. I mean, super creaky stairs. Pretty much that's the most notable part of it um but as far as there there really weren't any finishes that stood out as uh, shoddy it all looked kind of as a labor of love with all these um, updates and touches um the basement was almost completely standalone um so it'd be fantastic you know for kind of a later life child or uh, a little rental and um 
yeah, there really wasn't too much that stood out as like a, a major risk. I think one or two windows had blown seals. Um, there's that bathroom. I'm trying to find it in the photos that, oh, it's in the carriage house you know, with the make-believe bathtub, unless you're a very, very small person. Um, <laughs> the carriage house was also yeah. excellent. We thought, uh, the buyers and I thought that the exposed joists there added a lot and made a lot of light, though you can't help but wonder if uh, that carriage house would have been better off having that entire upper floor as its own bedroom. Um, and I, I opined because I wasn't entirely sure. Uh, whether or not that was to kind of skirt uh, an ADU law or something that Boulder tends to have or something to do with a short-term rental. Um, though, it, yeah, the house showed fantastic. Um, I'm trying to think of some other points for it. Are, this particular set of buyers is has a penchant for historic homes, and we've revisited... Well, go ahead. She's an architect yeah. <laughs> that focuses on historic home restoration. Well, they, you know them. <laughs> like, I've met them a yeah, few times, and, but... Yeah. And the hu husband's an attorney, uh, wor works for, I think, an investment company. Um, very kind people, very patient. Mm -hmm. uh, they've now lived in Boulder a few years and uh, always historic homes they've rented. And they know what they want, um, and, and we're patient working with them. Um, they're our type of people that, that they really have... Uh, I, I mean, they're they're they've got a ton of due diligence. They they understand opportunity costs. They don't want to they don't want to pull the trigger on the wrong house, um, and they're waiting for the right one. And and we're happy to keep showing them homes and advising them on homes. I think they I think they may have missed an opportunity on this one though. I mean, I, if creaky floors could have been fixed. Yeah, that um, wasn't the killer the, for him. Yeah. Uh, Okay. The lack of the garage is sometimes a challenge for a lot of buyers, but you do get this. This thing did have a carriage house, which. Um, was structured like an office. Mm -hmm. I, part of me wonders, you know, if, if all of it was permitted, but that's part of normal due, due diligence is to try to understand the permit record and um, and is this going to be a problem in the future? Because one of the things about um, Boulder is that our community cares a lot about whether work was permitted or not. And they have the potential, um, particularly if you try to, you know, get a rental license for that carriage house, for example, um, to deny it if it was not permitted. And in some cases, demand that you tear out the work. And I've seen that happen wow. to people that bought historic homes that had um, a carriage house that turned out to be a converted garage that shouldn't have had a kitchen and a bathroom. And all of it was ripped out. The, the shower was ripped out. Like they put it under, they bought the house and six months later, it's now being listed. And guess what? All that work has been removed. And I'm like, what happened? So I doubt that's the case, but that is it with 1844 Pine. But normal due diligence is you want to check the status of whether that work was permitted or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of wonder if they missed this one. This is such a beautiful home. Any other things stand out from the showing? Nothing too incredible. Um, it was a really nice place to be in. Whittier, for those who don't really know the area, it's pretty central downtown Boulder. Um, so it's kind of a, a little bit busier, maybe some more traffic noise, more foot traffic uh, and the like. But the backyard and the little carriage house and the way it's kind of laid out, it's still kind of secluded in its own little spot. And it feels it's a little bit tranquil just being there. Um, it managed well, to preserve it that. Is a it is a yellow line street. It's mm. going to get some traffic out front. And we listened um, for that, too. Uh, funnily enough, the um, mail guy came in or, like, you know, shoved his mail through the envelope slot in the door as we were inside. And you could hear the immediate difference once that little flap opened. You could hear just, like, traffic noise <laughs> pour in. Um, but it, it, for the most part, yeah. it was pretty reasonable. I mean, it's going to be hard to find something that is going to have no traffic noise on any of the kind of central downtown historic areas. If you got into Mapleton Hill, there are some streets, not Mapleton, but um, Maxwell. Um, um, there's a few. Majestic Height. Oh, Majestic Heights. Oh, my God. My brain is... Uh, Man. <laughs> my, my, wind, my cold brain. Um, Highland Avenue and Pine Street and Mountain View are super quiet, but the price point would have been double mm -hmm. um, what this home was. Or close to it um, for one that was that far west and in the quieter spots. So there's at every price point, there's some trade-offs. Mm -hmm. 
And also looking at the attic picture here, I do remember there's a very steep, but very, I guess, whimsical, fun uh, spiral staircase that heads up into that little spot. And I mean, it'd be great for children or I don't, the use case for an attic with kind of a, a lower and pitched roof is a little bit subjective, but it was just kind of like a fun little hideout area. Growing up, my godparents had a room like that. And so a little partial to it. I wonder if it was part of um, the finished square footage. Mm. And that's another thing we, I do want to point out, uh, that if square footage is really key, you should measure it yourself because it's very unlikely that what is being presented is accurate on the MLS. To the letter. Um, you know, in the, the house, if you just walk two blocks away, uh, you, you're now on Pearl and you're in the same block as Boxcar. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a pretty spectacular spot. Yeah, to be two blocks away from one of Boulder's most popular coffee shops, and to, for it to be a four square and have that beautiful brick and a lot of those finishes that are just a little bit no longer around. So we we don't know the full story. The home was under contract and then popped back out into active status, uh, still at two point eight five. Thirty days later, they cut the price to two point eight or just below it, and it sold for two point seven. Um, two point seven out of. 2.795 minus the one. You know, it's a 3.4% discount right in the middle of of um, what I would consider to be a pretty fair discount. Um, new listings, 1% to 3%. That is, well, so, sorry. New listings, listing list price or more is typically what they sell for. But if it's been on the market a month or two, 1% to 3%. If it's been on the market more than two or three months, you can expect 3 to 5% as a negotiated discount. But the seasonality factor is really important. Um, in fourth quarter, um, maybe it could have gone for less, but uh, yeah, considering it came back on market, I think it was a fairly reasonable uh, discount all around. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's it's pretty fair um, as far as the negotiation went, and the, and then the buyer did extract an extra thousand bucks for something that was attributed to closing costs, probably an inspection issue that's masquerading as uh, closing costs. Yeah, pretty minor one at a thousand. So that's. You know, that's a, a fair deal and a, a very good home purchase, I think, if you're into historic homes. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to add one thing. And if you look at these photos, Hamish, um, one thing that the previous owners did in their ownership tenure is all of the updates, um, the finished choices are, can I use the word appropriate, are appropriate for a historic home. What's the term? Like you don't see an ultra modern yeah. kitchen, right? With Period um, correct. waterfall. Is pure, it's it's authentic and in line with the character of the home. Yeah. I love the exposed brickwork. I love the butcher block countertops. There's none of the waterfall, modern home, uh, center island. Um, they didn't go over the top with the, the latest bronze yeah. fixtures. They've got chrome fixtures, probably because it wasn't done as a flip. Mm. Uh, six months ago, it was done five years ago or seven years ago. Um, and, and they chose fixtures that are appropriate. Or at least in line with the style of the historic home. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Nobody likes the word appropriate. <laughs> um, appropriate just makes you think of like, who are you to tell me what's yeah, appropriate? But it gives me like school um, flashbacks. It just, it's just when you see a historic home with a modern interior, there's just a disconnect. Yeah. That uh, that's can be tempting for people that want to modernize their house, but the homes that do what these guys did. Um, that choose finishes like this typically uh, sell for more than something that has a really hip modern interior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was tasteful, right, all the way around, and um, it's good to see. <laughs> I can't imagine if they, like, there's an ultra modern, everything brushed stainless, and like just. Uh, oh. We like tasteful, but with that said, if, even if you're an ultra modern home buyer, we're more than happy to represent you. I'm just, we're just talking about our personal, my personal taste in homes, um, not necessarily. And this particular right. listing too, right? You know, and, and this yeah. particular listing exactly. Okay, so I think that that covered um, the deal notes. Do you agree on that listing? I think so. Sale of the week. Um, that listing agent was fairly responsive to us um, and actually like pr quite communicative. So I think um, genuinely just props all around. You know, I think uh, at a sale of the week a while ago, we might have ragged on it a bit. This one, not so much. I think it was done quite well. 
That's, yeah. that's really it's refreshing when the counterparty is professional, mm-hmm. responsive, detailed. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's a it's a pleasure when our counterparties are like that. Okay, so let's acknowledge our our listeners. Thank you so much, podcast listeners, for joining us at the House Einstein Podcast. Um, we really enjoy your comments and um, for you to reach out to us and ask us to represent you and, and you telling us that you heard us on the podcast. We've gotten a few of those this year. Deeply appreciate that. Um, if you liked what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast. You can also subscribe to our newsletter. And if you're buying or selling in Boulder, um, I am more than happy to represent you personally. If you're in Denver, um, we have other agents on the team that probably would be the best fit for you, but reach out to us and let's talk about your real estate situation. We have a presence in Denver, in Boulder. We just closed a deal in Fort Collins and a deal in Golden. Um, we also do deals in Breck Winter and Park. Winter Park and Ward and Jamestown and Netherland. Um, but my primary focus is in uh, Boulder, particularly, but I also will go out of the market for our clients we, regularly. We get around, so, yeah. And you can find us at houseeinstein.com. And happy holidays to everyone out there. That's right. Take care.